Spooky Center here. Uh, I figured I'd put together a compilation of my favorite stories that I've written so far. Uh, so it's all in one package for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Stay spooky. A group of college kids just couldn't grow up, especially on Halloween night. They would revert back to their young selves and play silly games. They all got some drinks and went to the local cemetery. They were going to play Ghost in the Graveyard. The rules are simple. Have everyone except for the ghost stand at the home base while the ghost runs off and hides somewhere in the graveyard. Now, the home base players try to find the ghost. Meanwhile, the ghost attempts to jump out and tag players. If someone sees the ghost, they yell, Ghost in the Graveyard, and run back to home base. This game was going to be an exciting callback to their fun from their past, and would be a great relief to them now that they were expected to do so much adulting. There was something interesting about the graveyard on this particular night. It felt darker than usual. The moon was bigger tonight, but for some reason, it wasn't brighter. There was a dense fog around the graveyard that was cold when you passed through it. It was a perfect example of what a haunted graveyard should look like. It was perfect for tonight. They picked Robert to be the first ghost. He was fast and would get the game started right. They all went to home base, the grave of a man named Chester Brown. The group was stepping all over his grave, not paying attention to the morality of stepping on a human's grave, but were more concerned with the game above all else. Robert disappeared into the fog, mocking them that he would find them and scare them all. A few minutes went by, giving Robert the time he needed to hide somewhere. When enough time had passed by, everyone was unleashed into the graveyard. There was a lot of space and great places to hide, so Robert could be anywhere. Sam was all alone and wandering the graveyard, looking everywhere for Robert. He heard something and was convinced he had found Robert. He slowly crept over to the noise and prepared to jump past the tombstone to surprise Robert. He jumped forward and yelled, Ghost in the graveyard. It was Robert, but there was something wrong. Robert was a deformed and terrifying version of himself. His skin was melted. His eyes were blood red and sticking out of his face, and his clothes were ripped. Sam's smile dropped, and he took off to home base. He ran as fast as possible, completely terrified. He heard something chasing him, and it was right behind him. He got to home base, turned around, and Robert was not there. What the hell was that? Did Robert put on makeup, or was it something else? How did he look so convincingly like a terrifying monster? Suddenly, Sam heard multiple footsteps from different directions. From all directions, he saw Kanisha running towards him, then Becky, then Mondeep, and Mike. Everyone was back at home plate, and all had the same terrifying story about Robert's appearance. With either a shared delusion or something really wrong, they were done with this game and just wanted to go home. Suddenly, Robert came out of the fog. He looked completely normal. Robert said, I got all of you. He looked at the concern from everybody's face and asked, What's wrong? They all told him that they saw him out there, and he looked like a monster. He laughed it off and said, Look at me. It's just me. Your mind is playing tricks on you. After that, even though Robert tried to reassure the crowd, no one wanted to play anymore. They all walked back to their cars and called it a night. No one could explain how they had a shared mass hysteria. They did. As they were walking towards their cars, Sam looked back at the graveyard. In the distance, he could see a figure watching the group leave, then turning around to head deeper into the graveyard. I was on my way home from a late shift at my restaurant job. I had been driving for a while, and I was starting to get tired. 
so I decided to stop at a gas station I saw to fill up my tank and get a coffee. As I pulled into the station, I noticed that it looked a little run down and abandoned. There were two cars parked there, so someone was there at least. The overhead lights were dim, and some were burned out, and there didn't seem to be anyone around. There was a neon sign in the window that said open. Still, I was desperate for a caffeine fix, so I got out of my car and made my way towards the door. As I entered the station, I was immediately struck by how cold and damp it felt inside. The air was heavy and stagnant, and there was a strange smell that I couldn't quite place. I tried to ignore it and headed straight for the coffee machine, but as I reached for a cup, I heard a faint whisper coming from the corner of the room. I froze, listening intently. The whisper was barely audible, but I could make out a few words here and there. Help me, it seemed to say. I'm trapped here. I turned to see who was speaking, but no one was there. I looked around the room, but it was empty except for me and the cashier. I couldn't explain it, but I felt a sense of dread wash over me. I asked the cashier if he heard a noise. He said, no, but he looked at me with a questionable demeanor. I was starting to think that someone was actually trapped and the cashier knew something. I didn't want to say any more but I wanted to get some distance and call the police to check it out. I quickly grabbed my coffee and headed back to my car, trying to shake off the feeling of disgust. If he really had kidnapped someone, he was a terrible human being. As I drove off, I called the police and told them what I had experienced. A squad investigated the gas station and called me back a few hours later. They put a woman on the phone named Ruthie. She thanked me for calling the cops. Ruthie had pulled into the same gas station about 15 minutes prior to me. She had been ambushed by the cashier and was tied up and hidden in the back of the store. It was just blind luck that I was able to hear her and get out of there and call the police. If you hear a cry for help in the distance, make sure you answer the call. I was scrolling through OfferUp on my phone looking for a good deal on a new piece of furniture. I had been using the app for months and had found some great finds, but something felt different about tonight. There were multiple listings that seemed like it was from the same seller, and the pictures from that seller looked all blurry and distorted, making it impossible to tell what I was really looking at. As I continued to scroll, I stumbled upon a listing for a vintage chair. The picture was blurry, but I could make out the shape of it. It looked like it would be perfect for my living room. I messaged the seller and immediately received a response. It was strange. The response was almost instantaneous, as if the seller was waiting for my message. They offered to meet me at a location that was only a few blocks away from my apartment. I quickly agreed, excited about my potential new purchase. But as I got closer to the meeting spot, my nerves began to kick in. I was on a desolate street, with no other cars or people around. I pulled over and messaged the seller to ask if we could meet at a different location, but they didn't respond. Suddenly, I heard a tap on my window. I jumped, startled, and saw a man standing outside of my car. He motioned for me to roll down my window, and against my better judgment, I did. He didn't introduce himself or say anything. He just held out a key and pointed towards the nearby alley. I hesitated for a moment, but curiosity got the best of me. Reluctantly, I followed the man's instructions and found the chair he was selling. It was even more beautiful in person, and I was thrilled with my purchase. But as I turned to leave, I realized that I was lost in a maze of alleys. I pulled out my phone to use my GPS but it wouldn't connect. I felt a knot from my stomach as I realized how much danger I could possibly be in. I heard footsteps behind me and turned to face the man that I had met earlier, but this time he was different. His face was twisted with a sinister smile, and he was holding a knife. He lunged at me, and I barely managed to dodge and get out of the way. I ran as fast as I could, but I could hear him gaining on me. 
I turned a corner and saw a door. I quickly pushed it open and found myself in a dimly lit room. There were dozens of people in this room, all sitting at old, dusty computers. They were all using OfferUp. I realized I had stumbled upon a group of people who were using the app to lure unsuspecting victims into their trap. I tried to run, but one of the men grabbed me and dragged me towards a computer. Against my will, they forced me to log on to my OfferUp account and began messaging people on my behalf, luring them to the same location. I was trapped, and there was no way out. The men laughed as they watched their plan unfold, enjoying the thrill of the hunt. I begged for mercy. They only taunted me, telling me I should have been more careful. I felt like I was in there for weeks. I don't know how long I was trapped in that room, but eventually the police came to my rescue. They had been tracking the group for months and had finally caught them. I was the only survivor out of multiple people that had contacted my offer up to make a deal with who they thought was me. I was the only survivor. None of them were alive to tell the tale. After that horrible situation, I never used OfferUp again. Every time I even heard a mention about OfferUp, I would feel a shiver run down my spine. I had learned the hard way that not everything that seems like a good deal is worth the risk. Everyone loves getting scared at haunted houses, and a group of guys plus one girl. Matt, Will, Keith, and Bethany were no exception. They were looking for the scariest haunted house they could find and planned on going for Halloween. They have been to all kinds of haunted houses in the country, big and small, looking for the perfect one. But they were never satisfied because they thought all these haunted houses weren't very scary. They knew it was fake, and the rush they got when they were kids would just never be fulfilled. As they exited their sixth haunted house of October, a stranger approached them. He asked, how was it? They looked at him with disappointed faces and said, it's fine, but it's the same old thing. He looked excited to hear that because he was about to pitch them an exciting new opportunity. How would you like to go to a real scary haunted house for Halloween? They all looked intrigued. The haunted house he referred to was not open to the public and was only by special invitation. The man said, I know you've been looking for something more exciting than this. Are you interested? They all said yes and exchanged information. They left each other and would soon see each other with the promise of a real haunted house. Halloween was coming up and they all received their official invitation. There was a cryptic message that accompanied the ticket, but they all assumed it was part of the game. They got in the car and put the provided coordinates into the GPS. It pointed to an old, condemned neighborhood. They were all excited to go on this new adventure. They arrived, and there were guards at the front entrance. After talking to the guards, they were confirmed to be guests, and proceeded to park the car and head inside. There were a few other groups of people entering the main building at the same time. With everyone gathered, there was a major announcement from a man named Victor Bran. Hello everyone, Victor said. Welcome to the scariest haunted house you will ever find. As he was talking, there were footsteps and knocking sounds in the background. Everyone was looking around at the various noises, but Victor seemed to be oblivious to all the noises in the background. You are all here because you have been seeking out a haunted house. Well, this house is haunted, or something is really wrong with it. Here's the proposal. If you can last an hour in this house without exiting, you will win $100,000 each. Excited, everyone looked at each other and were happy with the additional benefit, but really they were just there for the scares. They all agreed, and Victor and his friends quickly exited their last words, good luck. The group of 15 people 
looked at each other and laughed at the situation. What a joke. As they were laughing, something fell in the other room. They all heard it and moved towards the noise. In the kitchen, there was a book that fell on the floor. Suddenly, all the cabinets opened and knives and plates flew out of the drawers. Multiple knives hit different people. This was starting to get real. Shocked to see that this wasn't a joke, three contestants sprinted for the door, namely the ones with knives protruding from their skin. The chairs at the table flew in all directions, hitting another person. The chandelier fell to the ground as well and shattered into pieces. Matt looked at Bethany. Do you want to get out of here? Bethany said, no. Let's just make sure we're not going to get hurt by something. The group got out of the kitchen and were now in the living room. Objects in the living room were flying at them as well. Pictures flying off the walls. Lamps smashing into walls. When the couches came after them, they all quickly ran upstairs. They found a bedroom with not much in it. They grabbed all the loose items they could find and threw it out in the hallway. They closed the door and huddled up in a circle. As a group, they had determined that this is where they were going to stay for the next 50 minutes. Unfortunately, their plan was ruined by this crazy house. 20 minutes had passed by, and they heard items slamming into walls and ceilings, glass breaking, and people screaming. They were terrified to leave this room at this point, but felt somewhat comfortable. They were all looking at each other, and just wanted this to be over. Out of nowhere... Will started shaking violently and foaming at the mouth. They all jumped up and Will fell over. He was dead. Bethany cried as she ran to the door. However, she stopped in her tracks. They all saw a puddle on the ground that came under the door. When they opened the door, water started slowly coming in, which was from an overflowing sink. The water must have got to Will and the water must be electrified. With this new threat, Matt broke the window and they all went to the roof. They walked across the roof a little bit while looking for safe passage. Matt found another window and broke it. They were looking for an alternate way down the stairs to avoid the electrified puddle. They entered the next room and went to the door to open it. The curtains they passed by caught fire quickly and suddenly, the room was ablaze. They all exited the room and were now in the hallway. Enough was enough, they thought. Keith, let's get the hell out of here. They went down the hallway as fast as possible, avoiding furniture and books slamming into the wall everywhere. Another room was on fire now. The bathroom sinks exploded and water was shooting all over the place. The windows all exploded as they were running towards the door glass flying everywhere. There was a roaring sound like the sound of a freight train or a tornado. This was pure madness. They all finally got to the front door and ran through it. They made it about 10 steps out the door and all the chaotic noises suddenly stopped. In front of them was Victor with two of his guys. Victor said, you all didn't make it. You had 20 minutes left. No money for you, all right? But he just didn't understand. We didn't care about the money anymore. Bethany screamed at Victor. You heartless bastard. We just lost our friend Will in that house. Victor said, Who is Will? When you came, it was just you three. They were all confused. Was Victor crazy or lying? Bethany said, Will came with us. And you shook his hand. Don't tell me you don't remember him. Victor said, Honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. You have to understand that this house is actually haunted. And you acknowledged when you signed a waiver of liability. The house makes you see things that aren't there. When he said that, they all looked back at the house. There was no fire, flood, or broken glass. The house was in perfect condition. Bethany looked back and asked Victor, Where are all the other people that played the game? Victor, looking irritated, said, There are no other people. 
We brought you three here to do the challenge, and that's it. Now if you're ready, you can get out of here. They all got in the car and started driving away from the house, happy that they still had their lives. As they were leaving the area, Bethany looked back. She saw Will, with hundreds of people behind him, staring at them driving away, with their white, ghostly glow contrasting with the dark very well. Haunted houses can be fun, but don't look for something too scary. It might be the scariest thing you ever did. There was loud thunder and streaks of lightning outside. It was predicted to be a major storm, and it was best not to go out in this mess. The rain was coming down pretty hard, and I enjoyed the rhythmic sounds of nature providing life to the world, washing away the dirty grime of the city. It was a great night to get under the covers and scroll through my Instagram feed. I had been scrolling through my Instagram for a while when I noticed that I saw something move from my peripheral vision. I suddenly got the feeling that someone was watching me. Seeing something move in the dark from my side began to be more frequent. Every time I looked up from my phone, I could see shadows moving. However, every time I looked up from my phone, I didn't see anything. I tried to ignore it, but it was getting harder and harder to do. I turned the lights on and looked around the room. I did not see anything on the sides or underneath my bed. I turned the lights back off and tried to get back into cuddle mode again. I was scrolling through my Instagram feed, trying to distract myself when I saw a post from a user I didn't recognize. The image was a black and white photograph of a man standing in the woods. His face was obscured by the darkness, but I could see the outlines of his body and freeze behind it. I felt a chill run down my spine as I looked closer. The man seemed to be staring at me directly, and there was something unsettling about the way he looked. The black and white post suddenly came to life and had motion. It was like the art picture motion that has become popular on different apps. The background was moving, and the hooded man began to walk forward towards me. I was intrigued, but also concerned. The man started to get really close to my screen, filling up the picture almost completely. I quickly closed the app and turned off my phone, trying to shake off the creepy feeling of dread that had settled over me. I knew after that I wouldn't be able to sleep that night. Suddenly, I heard a whooshing sound outside. I peeked through the blinds to see what was making that noise. There was a man with a hood looking right at me. He was starting to slowly walk towards my house. A group of friends gathered around a table on Halloween night. The objective was to test if this magic cup was really real. Someone had found videos on TikTok of a group of teenagers that found a cup with mysterious powers. When they drank from the cup, according to the onlookers in the crowd, they would convulse, their eyes would turn black, and they would say and do really crazy things. Nothing too crazy, just things like cry and tell funny stories about themselves, say crazy stuff. Things like that. It was like a paranormal way to pull something out of you, and it was just so entertaining. So Brian tracked down the group that had the cup and got it. He saved it especially for this night, Halloween night. Everyone gathered around as Brian slowly pulled the cup from the box. It was a plain cup with ancient carvings on it, with some more recent Sharpie writings on top of the ancient carvings. The modern writing said, do not drink from this, the devil's chalice, and cursed. The teenagers read all of this and laughed. So dramatic, one of them said. Brian asked the crowd, who wants to go first? Kaylee said, I'll go. Everyone looked at her with shock and laughter. She was the smallest person in the room at 5'2 and 100 pounds but she was the first to volunteer for this unexpected challenge. Haley asked what she had to do. Brian laid out the rules. He explained, first, 
you have to put alcohol in the cup. It doesn't matter what kind. Second, you need to prick your finger and add a drop of your own blood. She looked questionably at Brian, like, what did she just sign up for? He reassured her and said, just a small amount will do. Then he told her the most important thing. Third, you must say these words correctly or something can happen that is not good. The words were, Klaatu, Verata, Niktu. He told her to practice, but she was insulted by the request. She could say three words, and correctly. He needed to lighten up and stop micromanaging her. This was supposed to be fun. As Kaylee started the ritual, everyone pulled out their phones to record the whole thing. She put vodka in a cup and swished it around, giving the cup a little sniff, as if to ensure the vodka was really in the cup. Vodka has a terrible alcohol smell, but there's something about it that is alluring. Next, Brian gave her a pen to prick her finger. She did, and placed a drop of her blood in the vodka-filled cup. Next was the words. She looked at Brian and said, Klaatu, Verata, Biktu. Extremely concerned, Brian ran straight to her and tried to stop her from taking the drink. She messed up the words, and that is not good. He was too late, though. Kaylee quickly slammed the drink and wiped her mouth. She looked up, though, and saw fire and flames everywhere. It was a terrifying display of a hellscape. She was no longer in the house, but in hell. There were creatures down here, too. Then she saw something that really concerned her. She saw a demonic presence approach her howling in her face. She panicked and picked up a sharp stick and stabbed the demon through the head. It fell to the ground. Then, multiple demons approached her from the left, howling with an unbearable sound. She used her stick to dispatch all the demons that were coming to attack her. With all the demons dead, she wandered around the hellscape to find a way out. Why did she agree to this? This was crazy. Suddenly, Two more demons approached her, but they were keeping their distance. These demons were different from the rest for some reason in the way they were behaving. They were howling, but they were holding guns and were pointing them right at her, feeling like her life was in danger. She charged at them with her stick, but she didn't make it. She was gunned down by those demons and was dead. What really happened? was different than what was perceived. Haley was shot by police responding to a domestic disturbance back at the house where the ritual was performed. Everyone except one person was dead. They all had suffered from knife wounds. After drinking from the cup, Haley had lost her mind and went on a murderous rampage. First, she killed Brian when he tried to stop her. Then, everyone else got off the couch and tried to stop her. She took them all out. They thought that Kaylee was small, and they could all stop her together, but they were wrong. In the chaos, one girl was able to sneak away and call the police. She survived, but the damage was already done. The cup had the ability to make people do funny and outlandish things, but the ritual had to be done right. If not, there were major consequences. They knew of the dangers and did it anyways. Ancient artifacts are nothing to mess with. Through its long life, an object could have something attached to it that you don't want to let out. 